Thanks be to God. Hank Wilson, thank you for lugging the Gladden pulpit around for the last six weeks. And to all the deacons who assisted you in this, it's going back to the chapel after this and we'll rest, and so will you. <laughs> so thank you, thank you. It, for those who don't know, it's been in Parish Hall and come up to the sanctuary every Sunday, so thank you so much. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. With a bush that burns but is not burned up, a love that is genuine and good, and the way of the cross of Jesus and his disciples, our texts today show us the pivot points of God in Moses, who's in Midian, in Paul, who's in prison, and in Jesus, who's in Galilee. When God inspires each one of them to see what really matters as leaders of faith, God calls each of them into a deep prophetic imagination and seeing that God will prevail in the ways that people cannot even imagine. God is trying to get Moses to move from the sheep herds in a rural and faraway land and set God's people free from slavery in the heart of darkness ruled by Pharaoh in Egypt. Speaking from a burning bush, a bush that appears to be ablaze with fire and yet does not get burned, the still-speaking God of Israel proclaims that the cries of suffering, misery, and pain have been heard at last. Moses will be their liberator, and he will bring them into their promised land. Moses is not as sure as God is about this prospect. But God says, you can do it. God says to Moses, I am who I am. I am who I am. He says further, you say to the Israelites, your sisters and brothers back in slavery, I am has sent me to you. And just like that, Moses is commissioned to go and do justice. He is commanded to be the liberator of his people. Freedom looks a lot easier when you're alone in the desert with a bunch of sheep and a burning bush and rather vague instructions from God that when you go face to face with the Pharaoh, the ruler of the region, in the metropolis of pain and persecution, it'll all work out. Nevertheless, remember, God is always in the nevertheless. God sends Moses. Moses gets up and he goes on his assignment of liberation from oppression and the unjust labor of slavery. As hard as it is to prophesy deliverance from a desert, how do you feel and how do you free people from waywardness when you are a prisoner? Paul works with the only tools he has to free people while he himself is a prisoner. He knows that the heart and the mind, he knows that the soul and the spirit can never be shackled and never be tortured if they are free. If a person has placed his or her life in the hands of God, all things will work together for good, in Paul's words. Right now, I need you to use prophetic imagination. I need you to use your prophetic imagination. I need you to imagine for a moment that you are in a dark, damp prison cell. You have a piece of paper. You have a quill, pen, and ink. And you are alone with God and your thoughts, with rats and other prisoners too. I want you to listen to these words as they're brought home by Eugene Peterson in the message from Paul to each of us. Please close your eyes for a moment and just let these words sink in, wash over you. 
words written nearly 2,000 years ago and now newly interpreted for each of us. Just close your eyes and hear these words. Love from the center of who you are. Don't fake it. Run for dear life from evil. Hold on for dear life to good. Be good friends who love deeply. Practice playing second fiddle. Don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled and aflame. Be alert, servant of the master, cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. Help needy Christians. Be inventive in hospitality. Bless your enemies. No cursing under your breath. Laugh with your happy friends when they're happy. Share tears when they're down. Get along with each other. Don't be stuck up. Make friends with nobodies. Don't be the great somebody. Don't hit back. Discover beauty in everyone. And if you've got it in you, get along with everybody. Don't insist on getting even. That's not for you to do. I'll do the judging, says God. I'll take care of it. Our scriptures tell us that if you see your enemy hungry, go buy that person lunch. Or if he's thirsty, get him a drink. Your generosity will surprise him with goodness. Don't let evil get the best of you. Get the best of evil by doing good. Can you hear those words in a new way? Can you see yourself as a liberator too, having faith when faced with a bush that doesn't really burn but is on fire? Listening to the voice of God telling you to leave your sheep, your wife, your children, your family, and go on a virtual mission of death to free millions who are slaves? Is it any wonder that Harriet Tubman, the great conductor of the Underground Railroad, was called Moses? Can you see yourself believing in the power of God to simply love your enemy and have that person become the one you love most of all? That's the one you've been persecuted by and imprisoned by, becoming the source of your genuine love. Now can you see yourself like Jesus, knowing you will be beaten to near death only to take the cross that you'll carry miles as you're beaten more and then hung on that cross to die in the broiling sun with criminals on either side, turning toward this fate as you tur turn your feet and pivot from lakeside life to urban cruelty and crucifixion. That is what Matthew's Gospel is telling us. Matthew 16, 21 to 28, as I said, is the pivot point in the Gospel where Jesus gets real with himself and his disciples. No more strolls by the lake, far from the harsh crucifying realities of the capital city. No more confrontations with a handful of true believing Pharisees on the edge of the empire. No way, you're facing the toughest and most powerful now as you head toward Jerusalem. No more teaching and proclaiming God's holy word. No more healing and hugging the children and the crowds in rural Palestine. It is time to face your destiny. It is time to face the spit and the spears, the reviling and the revelation of your true messianic destiny. Is it any wonder that the heroes of our stories today might be swept away by angst? might be running a different direction than God tells them to go? Is it any wonder, faced with the sober reality of real life, tempered by social realities of their times, that these three would give up and hide 
But that doesn't happen, does it? We live in times when people bet on everything. Who among you would bet on Moses or Paul or Jesus to prevail against these circumstances and all the odds they're facing? Who would bet on them? I can guarantee that probably the same ones among you who would bet on Indiana yesterday would be the ones to bet on them, right? That would be nobody in this room! <laughs> Let's be honest. They don't get our bet in this deal. And yet our faith and our life are built on the overcoming of odds, the overcoming of death. Each of us knows the names of Moses and Paul and Jesus. None of us know the names of the other shepherds out there with Moses that day. None of us know the name of Paul's cellmates in prison. And none of us know the names of the children and the women and the men who heard Jesus speak as he pivoted to Jerusalem and turned his eyes to death on a cross. If you and I are to live the new social gospel for today, we need to know these texts because they guide us. We need to place our faith, hope, and love in the people who point us to God and not to all the bets and wagers that are placed against God. We also need to know the context of the times that we're in. We need to get real and we need to get informed with the social and political realities of the world that we live in. This Labor Day, we welcome our sisters and our brother from the Mid-Ohio Workers Association. The three of you and all your colleagues defend and protect Central Ohio's lowest paid workers who do significant and meaningful work, perhaps the most significant and meaningful work but are denied access to traditional forms of organizing via collective bargaining. And we need to hear and absorb the stories of these men and women who are witnesses for justice today. They fight every day as our lowest paid workers, believing that if a person is safe and if a person is cared for and fed, then all of us are safe. We also welcome into our building in these recent months One Fair Wage, which is organizing and planning for a November 2024 ballot initiative, which will call for a living wage for every Ohioan. Every day, they organize to make a better future for working poor in Ohio. See, our context is stark. The gap between America's richest and poorest continues to, to expand. The wealth gap between America's richest and poorest families has more than doubled from 1989 to 2016, according to a 2022 report of the Pew Research Center. Another way of measuring inequality is to look at a household wealth, also known as net worth, or the value of assets owned by a family, such as a home, or a savings account minus outstanding debt and a mortgage or a student loan. In 1989, the richest 5% of families had 114 times as much wealth as families in the second tier, the tier lowest in the median income. 2.3 million compared with 20,300. By 2016, the top 5% held 248 times as much wealth as the median. The median wealth of the poorest 20% is either zero or negative in most years. The richest families are also the ones whose wealth increased in the years after the start of the Great Recession. From 2007 to 2016, the median net worth of the top 20% increased 13% to 1.2 million. And from the top 5%, it increased by 4% to 4.8 million. In contrast, the median net worth of families in lower tiers of wealth decreased by at least 20%. From 2007 to 
Families in the second lowest se section of our, of our economy experienced 39% loss. In 2007, a household was earning $32,100 that they could accumulate. By 2016, it was $19,500. I want you to sit with those numbers a second. I know when you hear a lot of numbers all at once, it can overwhelm you. But that's stunning. From 2007, a household that was at the poorest level was at 32000 just nine years later, it was 19,500. The gap has grown even more in the last three years. You and I, as we practice our prophetic imagination and look to change the wrongs in this world, need to see the context that we're in, need to embrace the relationships as well that we have with God and with one another. Just like Jesus and Moses, we have to pivot and face the truth of our times, trusting that God will deliver us as we seek justice for all. Like Paul, we have to step out of our embattled and imprisoned mindsets and realities and overcome evil with good. We must love in spite of all that comes against us that pushes us to hate. Hate never wins. Love always wins. Hate never wins. Love always wins. As we come to Christ's table of love and justice, we need to remember not only him, but all those he stood for and stands for still. And we need to be witnesses for the new social gospel in this day and our age. Like Moses, Paul, and Jesus, we need to make choices to stand with people who've been left out and left behind, who have been forgotten and forsaken. And we need to be witnesses of love and justice. Let's just soak in these truths, the truths of the gospel. We will call, we are called every day, in every way, to justice, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. Amen.